I'm from Australia. I'm here at CERM uh, for a semester as the Jean Molay Chair. And uh, I'd like to start this session uh, this week with an introduction to, uh, to Bayesian statistical modeling and analysis. Uh, how many people here are very familiar with Bayesian statistics? Oh, perfect. Who's not? Okay, so this, this particular two hours is really starting at the beginning and it's targeted to the people who really have not seen very much Bayesian statistics, okay? So we just start easy and then during the week then we can build on that. So for those of you that are very familiar with Bayesian statistics, this will be a, a revision. Um, before we start though, because many of you have come from different places, I'd like to just give you an opportunity to, to turn to two people that you don't know, introduce yourself and say why you are here and what you do. Okay? Go. You've got two minutes. Introduce yourselves. <laughs> a lot of opportunity to meet each other. So during the week there'll be opportunity to meet each other, so please take that opportunity. Uh, I, I understand at the meal times there'll be a, a mixing of people where we sit, so take the opportunity to meet as many people as you can uh, in the class. These will become your colleagues and your networks uh, for the future. So let's start then with, um, with Bayesian statistics and we'll just start with a, a very common example but this is screening for cancer. So the story here is that we're going to start with Nicola here, right? So Nicola um, goes to the doctor, right, because he's not feeling so well. And I wish this wasn't cancer, Nicola, but Nicola's um, very confident of these tests for the, from the doctor because the test is actually very rigorous. The chance of a positive test, given that you have cancer, is 0.9. So 90% of the time somebody has cancer, this test will pick it up. The chance of a negative test, given that you have no cancer, is 0.95. So a good test, okay? This is how we judge tests. But this is not the question. What is the question when Nicola goes to the doctor? Nicola's question is going to be, um, so from the, from the perspective of the test, given the person has cancer, what's the probability that the test is positive? That's what the diagnostics tell us. Or from the perspective of the person though, given that the test is positive, what is the probability that the person has cancer? So the doctor comes back and says to Nicola, um, sorry Nicola, the tests come back as, um, as positive, you've got cancer. Is that correct? Well, the thing is that we've changed the, 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 um, the conditioning here. Instead of looking at the probability of the test being positive given that the person has cancer, Nicola really wants to know what's the chance that he has cancer given that the test is positive. So if we go through the, that, we can look at the answer to that given Bayes' theorem. So we could either draw it as a tree, 
or work it out as the calculation. So if we look at the probability of cancer, given that the test is positive, we know that that's going to be the joint probability of cancer and being positive divided by the probability of the test being positive. So we can use the, the decision tree here by going, okay, we have cancer or not cancer. We have, and if it's a very rare cancer, for example, let's say the cancer is one in a thousand, then it means that one in a thousand people are going to have the cancer. No, um, the rest are not going to have the cancer. The test is, um, if you have cancer, the test is uh, positive 90% of the time. If you don't have cancer, it's negative 95% of the time. So that's the bottom level um, here. Hang on, let me get my... so, um, so if we do this then, we can work out and we, we, we do the calculation on the right. So we're gonna look at the probability of having cancer and being positive. So we follow the top line. The probability of being positive, we've got two ways of being positive. One is correctly positive. One is misclassified uh, as positive. And we end up, Nicola finds out, that his chance of having cancer, even though the test has come back positive, is 2%. Well done, Nicola. <laughs> That's a big sigh of relief. Why is this so small? Tell me. It's a good test. Why is it so small? Because of the prevalence of this cancer. Right, because of the prevalence, because we have so many people who don't have cancer, so the probability of being misclassified there is, quite, is still um, 0.9, uh, 0.05, but um, that, that applies to a lot of people, okay? So it's your turn now. What if we have a more common cancer? What if it's 10%? Write down quickly what the answer would be. If it's 10%, what would be Nicola's chance if this cancer is more prevalent? So everything else is the same. The, 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 the test itself, what would Nicola's chance of having cancer be? And he's still hoping it's very small. Can you go back to the other way around this instead? Sure. So it's all going to be the same, except we're going to have a 10% um, a chance here instead of a 0.1% chance. Oh, I've missed something on the bottom line. Okay, what did you get? Who's got an answer? Okay. Hmm? Point what? Point what? Point zero one five. Let's have a look. So I got um, the probability of cancer given positive is point six seven. Anybody else get that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, we have the probability of. Um, Cancer as 0.1, of the probability of it being positive, we go through the same process, we get 0.135, probability of cancer given that it's positive. And I'm sorry, on the previous slide here, I, I neglected to put, where am I? Um, I neglected to put the denominator down here. Sorry. So we get um, the probability of it being um, cancer given that it's positive is going to be 0.9 times 0.1. Um, 
divided by probability of it being positive, and we should get 0.67. Okay, so the, the, this is really to talk about, uh, the, the, the purpose of this example was to talk about how what we're looking at is um, often uh, we need to be careful of the conditioning in our probabilities. So instead of looking here at the probability of the test being positive given that we have cancer, what we are interested in is the probability of cancer given that the test is positive. And this kind of conditioning, this kind of reverse um, um, prob or these probabilistic statements are really important in many areas, for example in law. So the prosecutor's fallacy is a classic example of this kind of conditioning. Um, so the probability of guilt given evidence versus the probability of evidence given guilt and these kinds of statements. So if you're interested in this kind of, um, these kinds of examples in law, does it, do people work with these? Does anybody work here in law in Bayesian statistics? So, um, so interesting um, cases there. So if we look at Bayes' theorem then, or Bayesian modelling, the overall aim here is to learn about the probability of our parameters, our unknown in our, in our models, um, given our data. Uh, y. So this is a p of theta given y. And I've written it in two ways here, the general sub Bayes theorem, because I can, we can think about this in two different ways. The first way, it's exactly the same formula for Bayes theorem here, but what we're going to do is to think about this as, here's our likelihood. This is what do we, how are we going to write out or understand our data in the context of our unknowns, theta, here? So this is like our model and our likelihood happening here. And then we ask, well, what do we know independently about theta um, um, aside from our data? So we can say, for example, if we're writing a model, we can say in the, in the, the parameters of that model, what do we know about them? Or even our input variables. So we say if we have a regression and we're looking at our um, predictive variables or our explanatory variables, what do we know about those? We can have uncertainty on those inputs and we have some measurement error models. Or we could have unknowns, we can have missing data. And so what do we know about those missing data? So all of that kind of information can be incorporated into our um, our prior here, P of theta, where theta might be our parameters or our unknowns or our true predictors as opposed to what we observe. Um, and then we, um, we have this normalizing constant P of Y which is going to be integrated or summed over the, um, all of the values of theta. So this is again what we saw before and what we're interested in is not the likelihood that we typically might use in a frequentist context, but we're actually interested in not in y given theta, but in theta given y. And we get at that by Bayes' theorem by saying what do we uh, know about um, our data in light of theta, and then what do we know about theta independently, and then, and then our normalizing constant here. And similarly, the same expression written here, but in this sense here we can say, Almost like what do we understand about theta before we start and then how do we add on information or learn more about theta in light of our data. So this kind of Bayesian learning or updating or iterative um, understanding of theta is another way of looking at this. So it's just two different ways of thinking about the same equation um, when we're looking at modelling. So our frequentist approach to modelling would say we have some data y and we want to know about theta and what we would do then is look through our likelihood, so p of y given theta. So how likely is y for best into, um, different values of theta and we can use moment estimators or mi maximum likelihood. What we really want to know about is p of theta given y. So how do we get to that? Well, we use our Bayes' theorem. So why do we want to do this? Well, we can look at um, un what do we know about um, possible values of our parameters? What other information can I incorporate into my models? And how can I describe the uncertainty in my model rather than just plugging in values? And how can I describe really complex systems by using this mechanism of um, hierarchical priors or putting, using prior information or multi-level models. 
That's the modeling side of it. And then we come to the computational side of it. So the computational side of Bayesian statistics also liberates us. So we're liberated in terms of the modeling because we have this prior context that we can use or hierarchical structure. And we're also liberated in terms of the computation because now we can use, and we can do this for, um, for maximum likelihood as well, but very commonly in the Bayesian framework, we can use our computational methods. So MCMC um, and approximations. So now we don't have to rely on just conjugate priors. We can have any, any type of priors. We can have quite complex models and we can get a range of estimates. Now that we have the probability distributions for theta, given y, then we can talk about the probability of that parameter directly, rather than indirectly as we would through confidence intervals, for example. What's the probability of theta being greater than a value that we care about um, in, in a particular context? What's the probability of um, a parameter um, that is associated with a person, so what's the probability of your theta one being bigger than your theta one? So we can look at the probability of, um, of parameters, um, like ranking of people or of, um, of um, entities based on these parameter values that they might hold. This is important, for example, in, um, in some work we're doing at the moment with the Australian Institute of Sport, where we're looking at comparing athletes. And so we have a model where we have different, uh, the, the parameter is associated with different athletes and we can compare them based on that parameter. Okay, so it's a, it's a probabilistic ranking rather than just ranking on the maximum um, uh, uh, likelihood estimate. So my potted history of Bayesian statistics looks like this. Start with Bayes in 1763, and really the way that Bayesian statistics was thought about then, or, or any statistics really, was in probability theory. So it was called probability theory. Bayes and Laplace um, um, independently came up with the, the sort of the, the construct for this. But there were two main arguments about Bayesian statistics in the time. Tell me what they were. So lots of people doing Bayesian stats here. What were the two fundamental arguments against Bayesian statistics? The early days. I'm sorry? The issue with the prior information. Prior, right. So what was the problem? Subjectivity. Well, what do you ask you? How do you know the prior? Exactly. So subjectivity and priors. What was the other problem? Computation, right, so two problems. One is how do we get that theta, uh, sorry, p of theta, and how do we get the p of y? Okay, so, so, um, so Boole and Venn had different ways of thinking about the world, um, about probability, and we know Boolean algebra and, and, um, and Venn diagrams and so on. So Boole and Venn were arguing their point of view um, and really arguing against Lebes and Laplace. Meanwhile, Fisher and Neyman came along and they said, well, let's just work with the likelihood, p of y given theta, and we'll have all this likelihood-based indirect inference. So we have um, inverse probability um, cons um, ideas coming up, and they really took off. So you can see the, the dotted line is the frequentest um, construct, so coming up. Um, meanwhile, Jeffries was working on priors and really starting to understand and promote objective priors, and so coming, um, overcoming that problem. Geeman and Geeman really started to um, liberate the computational aspects through MCMC. And I've got Gelfand, Gelfand and Smith there as well because they really saw the, the opportunity for Gibbs sampling um, to be applied to Bayesian statistics. So this was really a way of freeing up these two or addressing these two major problems of um, priors and computation. And then that's led now to our Bayesian statisticians for today, um, as you can see some of the, the presenters, and there's a whole raft of people here who will be presenting as well. So there we come to our modern Bayesian analysis. So these two issues of priors and computation are still very much um, a, a subject for research. Who here is working on priors in Bayesian statistics? Anybody? Yeah? Tell us briefly what you're doing. Briefly. Introduce yourself. Tell us briefly. Hello, my name is Paul. I work in a group that was in NAC. 
So we right now we focus on trials for the variance or size parameters of random effects to make them shrink so that if you have seven random effects, it just well it doesn't eat up all your data. Good. Okay, so prize for, for more complex models, so for random effects models, really important. Who here is working on computational aspects, Bayesian analysis? Is that a hand up the back? Okay, right up the back. Okay, well, introduce yourself, tell us what you're doing. Uh, my name is Simon. Uh, I'm one of the speakers who you have about right. okay. That's right. Okay, so you'll tell us later. Okay, who else is working on computational stats? Did I see another hand? Yeah, I'm working on... Um, Who are you? I'm Alexander, I'm a student of Nicholas, and I'm working on, um, uh, let's say, I'm trying to make a uh, patient computation scale, so think about matches that work in high dimensions. Great. All right. So, um, so let's just think about a very simple Bayesian example, and um, this is for people, most people here will know this, some people won't have done this, so let's just go through. We have y is the number of successes from n trials. Our unknown parameter here would be theta, the probability of success. Y is going to be binomial n theta, and so we have our likelihood here, which is going to be proportional to theta to the y, 1 minus theta to the n minus y. So what's the prior that we could use for this? So if we think about a prior, we could use a point prior. We could just say there's two, two options for, for theta. It could be point one or point three. And there's some probability attached to either of those. Perfectly reasonable prior. We mightn't be that certain. We could say theta ranges anywhere in its range from zero to one. But based on previous studies, it's more likely to be around point one, less very likely to be very unlikely to be larger than 0.8. So in a lot of the work that I do where we're looking at eliciting expert information, that might be the kind of statement that we get. And then we have to say what kind of prior um, or distribution might we use to represent that kind of information. Tell me a reasonable uh, distribution that we might use for theta in this case. Theta is our under underlying probability of success. A beta distribution. Okay, so a beta distribution um, is uh, parameterized by two hyperparameters, alpha and beta. Um, this is the uh, distribution for um, uh, the, uh, the, the distribution for theta here. Uh, this is the expected value, this is the variance. So we can see here that um, from the variance here, larger values of alpha and beta are going to give us a more concentrated distribution. Okay, so smaller alpha and beta will give us a, um, a less or more diffuse distribution. Um, these are some of the shapes that we can get from, um, a, from a beta distribution. So here's a beta half-half here, um, a beta one-one, um, and then we go uh, through all the different variations. So very many different um, dis uh, constructs or forms that we can get from this distribution. All right, here's your turn. With your um, neighbour, I'd like you to, if you haven't introduced yourself to your neighbour, do so, but I'd like you to match quickly those beta distributions to those, um, those shapes. Go. You have one minute. Let's see how you went. Um, just going to pick somebody. 
So let me pick, oh, this is, this is terrible, isn't it? But I'm going to pick on somebody. I'm going to pick on you there. Yeah. yeah. So do you, want to, do you want to tell us what you found? Tell us who you are first. Uh, so I'm Maria. Uh, Maria? I'm a PhD student at the India Run Okay. Uh, so uh, we found that the first must be beta 100 100. A beta what? Uh, beta 100 100. For the first one? Uh, yeah. Okay, who, who agrees? I'd say, so, so what, what would the, I'm just going to stop you there. So what would the option be? Uh, so I would say it's a beta 1 1. Okay, beta 1 1. Yep, okay, next one. Beta 2-2? Two, two? Oh, okay, yep. And next one? What do you think? Tell me. Just tell somebody. Somebody tell me the answer. What do you think? A beta 10-20? Yep, okay. Next one down here? Beta 9-1? Beta 9-1, yep. And the next one? A beta 2-1? Yep, okay, because it has an expected value then of what? What's the expected value going to be? Alpha on alpha plus beta, so two-thirds, yeah? So it has an expected value of two-thirds. And the next one, the last one? A beta 100, 100, okay? Yeah, so it has an expected value of a half, large values of alpha and beta, so it's going to be quite concentrated around a half. Okay, so, thank you. <coughs> okay, great. So you can see we get different shapes, we can match them to the betas, all right? Okay, so, um, so the first one, for example, um, it might be a response to, I, I really don't know, it could be any value between zero and one with the, any, with the same probability. Okay, but that is informative. That's not just a non-informative prior, okay, because I'm actually giving probability to every value along the, uh, between zero and one. And in some cases that might be quite informative. Um, so, and the last one, how would I interpret this last one here? I'm pretty sure it's a half. In fact, I'm very sure it's a half, okay? So, um, so uh, there's, uh, there's two bits that we're getting out here. One is where do we think the, the concentration of the probability is, and also how sure are we about that, okay? All right, so when we get our posterior, then we're going to multiply our likelihood by our prior. So we multiply our likelihood here by our prior here, we rearrange, and we end up with something that goes theta to the something minus one times one minus theta to the something minus one, which again is a beta distribution. So we've gone from a beta prior, we've multiplied it by a binomial likelihood, and we end up with a beta posterior distribution. So now our beta prior was just a beta AB, and now we have a, a posterior distribution includes now our data, y and n minus y, and our prior here. So we have this combination of our data and our prior. And we can see that it's a weighted combination because as we get more data, what will happen? The data will start to have more influence in our posterior distribution. And if we had a very strong prior, in other words, if alpha, if A and B or alpha and beta are large, then they're going to play more of a role in this posterior distribution. And that's just what we would want to happen. We would want our priors, if we strongly believe our priors, to have a, a larger role in our, in our um, posterior distribution. And as we gather more data, we would want those, those data to be playing more and more of a role. And we can see how that would happen in this simple case. Okay? All right. Um, so here's your turn. Just very quickly, we have a binomial example, 22 successes and seven failures. I want you to take one of these priors and I want you to work out the prior mean for theta, posterior distribution for theta, posterior mean for theta and then um, we can talk about the last one. So very quickly, choose one of those priors, work it out. What's the prior mean? 
the posterior distribution and the posterior mean. Is this okay? okay. It's good. Okay, let's see how you went. Who chose a beta 1-1? One, one? <coughs> Who chose the first one? No one. Ah, we have one maybe chose here. <laughs> okay, let's, what's your name? Uh, Eric. Eric? Okay, Eric, what did you get? What's your prior mean? Uh, 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5, yes, we're away. Okay, what's your posterior distribution? Right, perfect. Okay, so we just we've got the one one, and then we're just going to add those those values to the likelihood. Okay, beta twenty three eight, and I'm sure you could draw that in your mind now. Okay, what that would look like. All right, what's a posterior mean going to be? Uh, twenty three over thirty one. Okay, twenty three over thirty one. Okay, all right. So didn't okay, perfect. That do. All right, who did a nine one? No one. Okay, yes? What did you get? <coughs> yep. Yep, prior means 0.9. That's it, yeah. Yep, 0.9. Posterior distribution uh, is going to be. So it's going to be 22 plus 9 and 7 plus 1. Okay, oh sorry, 22 plus 9, yeah, and 7 plus 1. Okay, and the posterior mean then is going to be that, um, it's going to be what? What's the posterior mean? 0.75. Okay, good. Okay, and a beta 100, 100, let's have a look. So, First one should have been 0.74, uh, sorry, so the sample proportion would be 0.76. The posterior mean for beta 1-1 is 0.74. The posterior mean for a beta 9-1 is 0.79. And a posterior mean for a beta 100-100 is 0.53. Is that what you got? Yeah, okay. So what's happening here? So we can see again, as we said before, that the, as, our, as our prior increases in, um, in strength, if you want, or in, in concentration, that we start to move towards the prior. We've got the same amount of data here, but if we move from a beta 1, 1, then we've moved from a sample proportion of 0.76 to basically the mode here, 0.74. Okay, so this is going to be um, when we've got this, uh, this uniform prior, we move to a posterior um, mean of 0.74 um, because we're allowing for that probability across the whole space now, okay? But when we've got a beta 100, 100, we actually move much closer to the prior mean, okay? Because it's like having those extra observations, um, many more, much more strength in our prior. So it's so just a way of demonstrating 
the, the relative importance of our prior compared to our data. Okay, so the nice thing about this is we, this leads us then to this idea of Bayesian learning or dynamic updating. If we obtain more data, we don't have to redo all of the analysis. And this is important because um, if we have, for example, a beta 1, 1, and we get some data, then we can update our posterior distribution. And then if we, that, that posterior distribution becomes our prior distribution when we get more data. And then we update that to a new posterior distribution. That's our new understanding of the probability of success. And then we can add more data to that. That becomes our prior or what we understand now. We get more data and we update. Okay, that becomes our prior. We get more data and we update. And that's our sort of iterative updating or Bayesian learning mechanism. So this is used, for example, in, um, in a case, the project that we have at the moment. Um, so imagine, I'll just put this to you and see what you, what you think. So imagine a situation like restaurant ratings. Okay, you know when you're online and you can, you can rate a restaurant, thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, so people are gonna go to the different restaurants and they're going to give thumbs up or thumbs down to the restaurants. So how would we analyze those kinds of data? How would we be able to tell, like rank our restaurants? Okay, so the, we had this brought to us as a problem. How do I use this information to be able to give ratings or rankings to my restaurants? All right, that's the problem where now I have for each restaurant, so I have five restaurants and I have a certain number of um, thumbs up, thumbs down and I'm getting those coming in regularly and I want to be able to rank my restaurants those five restaurants. All right, you've got two minutes to talk about it. What kind of model would you write? How would you do it? And what do you need to think about? Go. Solve, solve their problem in two minutes for me. people have been thinking about? Um, so again, I'll just choose somebody to start the conversation, but then we'll, um, we'll continue it. Um, let's say 
What's your name? Um, the, you woman um, in the stripy shirt, the black stripy shirt, and the pink jumper. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Yen, and uh, we were discussing how to run the restaurant with one tool based on Sihat. So yes. We want to the cost here. Um, why do you want Sihat, and we run by maximum two minutes? Okay, so we have, so what you're saying is that we're going, we've got this parameter theta for each restaurant. Yep, so we've got theta one up to theta two, uh, theta five. That's what you're saying. And then you're going to estimate those thetas and then rank them on the thetas, yeah? Okay, so how are you going to estimate the thetas? Uh, we're going to compute the post here um, distribution. Okay. So like, like this example, using a, a binomial distribution, and what would the, so what would be the y in this case, and the n? Uh, the, the trials, the results of the trials, like the number of the thumbs up and thumbs down? Great, okay, so the number of thumbs up could be the y, and the total number of votes could be the n, yeah? yeah? Okay, and so then how would this iterative updating come, in, come about? Why would we need this idea? Because as I get more data, I wouldn't want to... Yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, we wouldn't have issues because if we ask you one so to get reviewed by 10 people and the other 100 people, then the posterior maybe... I mean, same, so how we could weight the number of the reviewers. That, that okay, so do you, how do, what would be an answer to that? So we've got a, num, different numbers of reviewers on the, for the different um, restaurants. Does that matter? Yeah, if you're ranking by expected value, obviously you might get a few that are the same, even if your wall was more important. Right, so, so we've got to be careful about ranking just on expected value. And this is a case, it's a really important case that we don't just rank on expected value. And this is where, for example, in Australia, and I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but there are schools that are ranked on, on similar things, just on expected values. There are hospitals that are ranked, universities that are ranked on expected values. And so we get phone calls that say, last year I was ranked number one and now I'm ranked number 10 hospitals. Okay, and why? Because there's some variation in that. So what we need to do then is to look at the probability that one restaurant is different, from, is better than another restaurant. Okay, so we can get that because we have the posterior distributions. We have the posterior distributions for each restaurant and we can look then at the probability that one restaurant is different from another or, or better than another. Yep. And if we, for example, two restaurants been reviewed by 100 and by 10, then if five, half of them they showed for the, then we'll have the data which is about 25 to 4. But when you plug in with the prior, then we'll end it up with quite similar ranking, then we say that restaurant is the same as that, even though the reviewers are totally different. Okay, all right, good point. So this is a general idea of how we might do this. What are some other issues that we might want to consider? We have some more prior information, like the density of the area in which the restaurant is living, and that would be influenced by variance. Perfect, okay, so we have some other information. For example, the density of people that live in that area. We could use that to, to integrate in. What else? Uh, if the same person ranked multiple restaurants, they're correlated. Okay, so we might have correlation with the, different, uh, the same person ranks multiple restaurants. That leads us then to, an, to another interesting question. Who else has got something? Yep. Non-response rate. Uh, is rating compulsory or not? Why does it happen? What it, what it means? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so some people may not rate because they really like it or because it's just average or because they hate it. Okay, so we have to look at why people don't rate. But coming back to this question of we have different people who rate um, differently. So, for example, if I, if I, I might um, give a thumbs up 
I might have a tendency to give a thumbs up more than you. So I might be a, a happier customer more often than you, you know, and so you're, you know, you've got a really high level for your, for your restaurants, okay? And so for you to give a thumbs up, it's really high. So we have this, um, we have this issue where different raters will have different general thresholds, okay, and also different restaurants. We want to know about the restaurants, but taking into account the ratings of that. So do we have kind of the, what kinds of models could we use for that? So, go on. Yeah, so we could put a random effects on the people, okay. Um, so we need to have then a, a people effect in the model, okay, and we can, we can do that. And that kind of uh, modelling is used, for example, in ranking ex exam scores or, or um, where we have, for example, a student's ability, general ability, and then the question difficulty and those kinds of models that's taken into account. So these kinds of things are what we're thinking about for this restaurant case. And in fact, the restaurant example is not the real example, um, so this was brought to us, but um, based on that also we have set up this, um, this small company where we're doing better beliefs, it's called. So companies who want to um, al allow their employees to put up a proposal or a hypothesis about how to improve the system of their organisation. And, um, and then people in the organisation will vote that hypothesis up or down, so that proposal. And it's a way of getting people across the organisation to be able to contribute ideas and to have them voted by other people in the organisation. Um, and it's interesting, Expedia has taken this on and also emergency services in Australia and other organisations where they're trying to um, allow people in the organisation to promote uh, good ideas for the organisation, like we should all get more pay, things like that. <laughs> okay. So we can also draw our uh, model as a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. Um, uh, so we see here, for example, we have Y, our, um, our data here, and so this has some uncertainty, it's in a circle. Uh, theta is our unknown here, Y is affected by or impacted by theta and N, N is our number of observations that's a, um, given, so it's in a square, and A and B. In, our, in this example here, these are also given values, um, and that, that um, so theta is defined then by A and B, um, or has a distribution that is, uh, has parameters A and B. We could also, if we wanted to, to have an a, uh, an a and a B with priors on those as well, but we would need to have that information in our data or externally. So we can now take that same idea to a normal model. So just imagine now that we have a vector of data, um, y1, a vector of observations, y1 to yn, I've just called it d here. Uh, we have our unknown is going to be the mean, and we know our sigma squared, okay, for the data, sigma squared y. So what we can do then is write down our likelihood um, here. Uh, it's just going to be a normal distribution. Uh, we have a conjugate prior, so a conjugate prior like our, uh, in our case for beta distribution, we started with a beta um, prior, we multiplied our binomial likelihood and we ended up with a beta posterior distribution. So a conjugate prior is one where the, 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 the prior, the distribution for the prior and the posterior are the same. All that's happened is we've changed the parameter values. So here again, we have a, a normal distribution for mu as our prior here, parameterized by these hyperparameters, mu naught and sigma naught squared. So this is what do we know about mu um, before we start. We have a posterior distribution then, which is going to have the same form as our prior. So it's a normal distribution, but now the parameters have changed. So the parameters now are again this combination of our prior here and our data. And it's this weighted combination of the prior and the data there. So what happens as my, my n increases? 
So here we are in our, in our posterior mean, what happens as n increases? We can see here that the data are going to have more and more of a role, okay? That the data there is going to become more important in this. Um, and if our prior is very strong, in other words, if sigma, sigma naught squared here is small, so I have a, a concentrated prior, then this value here is going to be larger. So our prior is going to play more of a role. So again, it's this combination, weighted combination of our prior and our data in the normal case. Okay, so you can go through the, the maths of that to show that this is the, um, the case. So we can also talk about our prior predictive distribution and our posterior predictive distribution. So our prior predictive distribution is going to be um, our prior um, is going to be what do we predict for our data just based on the prior. So integrating over the um, the the, un the unknowns in this case mu. And if we look at that then what we get is we get a prior predictive distribution which has the prior mean which is what we would expect but now our posterior, sorry, our variance here is going to be based on our prior variance and the variance from our data which is what we would expect, okay? The posterior predictive here is going to be the posterior distribution um, here, so now what we're doing is we're conditioning now um, on our data as well. So our posterior predictive distribution is going to be conditioning on our data and if we do that, we end up integrating over this times the, the distribution of mu given um, the mean and the variance here. And so if we do that, we get a posterior predictive distribution for y, which is going to be based on that posterior mean that we calculated before and the variance again which is going to be our posterior mean and the, um, the variance associated from the posterior and from our data. So again this is saying that we have some uncertainty in our posterior um, predictive variance due to the observation noise sigma squared and the uncertainty due to the parameters. Okay, so where might we use the prior predictive and the posterior predictive distributions? Give me an example where we would use those. Why do I care about those? I observe a sample. I'm sorry? Uh, you observe a sample of mm -hmm. observations, and knowing the samples, you want to produce the next one. Okay, so I observe a sample of observations, and now based on that sample, I want to predict the next value or another value. So this posterior predictive distribution is important for that. Why, why do I care about a prior predictive distribution? Uh, when you have a model, to, you want to validate it, and a way to validate your prior beliefs to look at the data that they create. Right, great. Well, because practitioners don't worry about parameters. They don't care. They don't know what is a parameter. They want what is the next observation? We were thinking of a parameter. Right. So they might care about the posterior predictive distribution. Yeah? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yep. But the prior predictive distribution, you're right, is important for the modeler to understand um, what, they're actually, what, what does their prior imply. So you can use the prior predictive distribution to say, you know, I've set up these priors in my model, and especially if I have a more complex model, what does that imply in terms of the data that I would expect to be generated from those, that set of priors or based on those priors? So we can use this, we've, um, we've used this uh, in a case where we want to understand what hyperparameters to put on our prior distributions. So if, for example, in our beta um, prior, what would a, a, a sensible A and B be? Okay. Well, you know what I mean? What would I set as a sensible A and B um, or alpha and beta? So what I could do then is I could work out the prior predictive distribution for my binomial case and I could then 
Um, so I, I choose an alpha and a beta, and I could use the prior predictive distribution to give me a set of data that would be conceivable with that prior distribution. Does that make sense? And then what I can do is I can look at that set of data and say, is that sensible or not, based on some criteria? Would that, is that set of data surprising? So it might be surprising if it's all, um, all down, like right, really close to being um, like a lot of zeros and only a few ones, or vice versa. Or I might be very surprised if it's very dispersed, depending on what my prior beliefs are. But it's like, what would I expect to see? And so I can use that to calibrate what that alpha and beta might be. Okay? And I could even give distributions for those as well. So this prior predictive and posterior predictive distributions are important. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Do you use them? What do you use them for, Nicola? Prior and predictive, prior predictive and posterior predictives. I rarely use them. Rarely use them? Okay. At least the prior predictive. Yep. Okay. Yes. I was wondering, because the model might be based, uh, biased, so isn't it possible that this prior predictive be introduced uh, and voluntarily uh, noise in the model? Yes, absolutely. So that's one, uh, so your prior predictive distribution can tell you about the noise that you're introducing into the model. So you're right. So, it, so in some ways the prior, the prior can, uh, if, you, if you are concerned about bias in your model, then you can use the prior to either understand that or correct for it. Um, but also you can say, am I introducing too much noise in my model by my prior? Is it too vague? And am I just like, create, like introducing noise? Okay, so do I need to make it more informative than just very vague? So there are different ways that we might look at using this prior predictive and posterior predictive distributions. They are important to know about. All right, so just another very quick exercise. Let's say you have y equals 2 and you wish to estimate the population mean. So we have a prior here of mu and sigma squared equals 3. Sorry, that's our, our likelihood. And our prior is going to be normal 0, 1. So I want to know what's the posterior distribution for mu. So just take that and then tell me what the, um, the posterior distribution for mu is. I'm going to put the formula back on in a minute. So just, just write down the, the, the bits that you need from there. Don't worry about, um, don't worry about four unless you, four and five, unless you get to it. But just write down, we've got y equals two, we have y given mu is mu and sigma squared y equals 3, and our prior is a normal 0, 1. Okay? Got that? All right, let's go back to the formula. That's the bit you need. Will be a relief for the rest of the course, that the rest of the week, that you can use your computers to do this. But just for right now, <laughs> sort of see what happens. We've gone from a normal zero one prior. We've got this one bit of data, y equals two. How is that going to change what my understanding of mu is? N equals one. Yeah.
Okay. What did we find out? So we go, so our prior, so we start off with a prior, I'm trying to find out what mu is. My prior belief is that mu is um, zero, normally distributed um, around zero with a um, variance of one. So, um, so now I observe a value of two. And what is my posterior distribution now? A normal what? So what we should have got um, is we observe two. We have this as our, our data are coming from a normal with unknown mean mu and a sigma squared of three. If the prior is normal zero, one, then what you should have got, I've got slightly different notation here, well, n is one here. So what I should have got is a prior mean, um, a posterior mean of a half, which is what I would expect. And my posterior, um, so hang on, is that right? Is that right? Yeah, okay, good, thank you. And um, posterior variance is 0.75. If my prior is 2, 1, then I'm going to get um, a mean, a mu1 of 2, and a posterior mean of 2, and I'm going to get a variance again of 0.75. If my prior is a 0, 10, then I'm going to get um, a mean of um, one, posterior mean of 1.54, and a posterior variance of 2.3. Okay, so my prior was zero, and I saw a value of two. So my posterior mean is 0.5. Why is it not one? Why is it not halfway? I thought it was zero, I saw two. Surely I would expect it to be, my posterior to be one. Why is it not one? Because your data is less precise than your prior Perfect. Because I've, my data is less precise than my prior. Okay, this is a weighted combination of my data and my prior. Okay, and similarly down here, um, I see my prior here is now much more diffuse. So I see a value of two. My data, my prior is more diffuse, so I move much more closely to my, prior, to my data. Okay? So it's this combination of my data and my prior. All right. Again, we can do dynamic updating. So in the same way, so Kevin Murphy has a nice um, article on this. Uh, so sequentially updating a Gaussian mean, starting with a prior centered on mu naught equals naught. The true parameters are mu star equals 0.8. You don't know that. Sigma squared equals 0.1. You know that. And so as you start to get more data, here's an n equals 1, here's an n equals 2, here's an n equals 10. So very quickly, the data start to overwhelm the prior in this particular case. Okay, so you can see here how we can also start to calibrate our prior by saying how many observations worth of uh, is my prior. Okay, so, uh, and so I can think about it in the same sort of terms as my data. Right, so if I do that then, um, so I just want you to draw a DAG then of that normal model. So we have a normal um, likelihood and a normal prior. Okay, draw me a DAG.
Yeah, sorry, I can hear you. I'm just going to keep going without a break. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have a break, don't we? So you should have Y at the bottom. Y is going to be connected to, or Y is going to be um, influenced by mu and sigma squared. The mu is going to be influenced by mu naught and sigma naught squared, and there's an N floating around in there somewhere. Yeah? So if you've got a picture, I want you to show somebody that's not beside you, somebody else. Turn around and show the person behind you your beautiful dag. See if you've got the same picture. And if it doesn't look like anything, then you can just look at theirs. Okay. Show, show your picture. So that's the normal um, model. And now we come to something where we're starting to understand how we might build on that model. So we have a normal model, we have a binomial model. We've seen those simple cases. So let's think about these hierarchical models now, how we start to add more complexity to our model. So this is useful where our observations or parameters have a natural structure. So we can describe more complex priors here. So we can, it can also simplify the computational strategies if we, if we have this hierarchical nature. So we can think about Y here, YJ, um, coming from a, a, some distribution that's characterized by theta J now and some other parameters phi. So theta J given phi is going to have a distribution, okay? characterized by theta j given the phi's, and then the phi's themselves are going to have some distribution. So we can now think about these different layers. So the y's will have their distribution um, based on theta j's, and then the theta j's will have their distributions based on some other parameters, and then those parameters will have priors. So for example, if we're in a case where, what's, what's an example where I might use this kind of hierarchical structure? Tell me. Inside one random effect, you will have a random effect as it goes over the classes with the beta j's and the size of the random effect or some other thing in the random effect would be the final. Perfect. Okay, give me a concrete example. What would be an applied example? Uh, autoregressive process of order one would have, uh, well then phi would be two-dimensional, the size and the autocorrelation parameter and uh, beta j's would be all the different uh, time points, for example. Perfect. Okay, nice example. What's another one? In data collect from different countries or different regions, you may apply uh, Exactly. Okay, great examples. All right. So um, this is an example of a, of a study that um, I was involved in. Um, Mark Stanaway is a PhD student of mine who works with the Department of Primary Industries and is interested in biosecurity, plant biosecurity. So um, what they wanted to know was how to model this particular plant pest. Now I don't know whether you get this pest here, but on the weekend we went out to um, to some of the vineyards around, and there's that little white snail. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a real pest in the, it's across everything. So, um, so I was pleased to see that. I've got some photos of snails, but let's just do the photo of the spiraling white fly. So this is a pest. You can see it's across a large region of, um, of the world. And um, it lives on more than 100 hosts. So they're the kinds of plants that this pest can live on. And what it, um, what it does is that it actually um, it reduces the, uh, the efficacy of the plant. 
So it's a, um, uh, so, yeah. so basically what we know about it then is we have some literature, we have inspectors who go out and look for these um, pests and we also have some surveillance, the surveillance data then um, which is more than 30,000 records. So we want to know then how to, to understand the, the, um, the scope of the, uh, like the region that's infected and also the spread. So how is this um, pest spreading across the region, across local, district and statewide? So um, maybe the hierarchical Bayesian model then is going to start with a data model. So just thinking about that hierarchical structure, we have the probability of the data given the incursion process and the data parameters. We then have the process model, which is the probability of the incursion process given the process parameters. And then we have the probability of the data and the process parameters that we can also build in. Okay, so that's the way that we might think about this sort of uh, multi-level structure. So the posterior distribution of the incursion process is then going to be a function of each of those. Okay, the probability of the data given the process and the parameters times the probability of the process given the parameters times the probability of the parameters. Okay, and so breaking it down in that way means that we can start to model each of these bits. So what do we learn? Well, for early warning surveillance, that's um, before the pest gets there, we have our priors and we can build a map or uh, Mark build a map that looks like this. So this is based on our prior understanding of the probability of infestation across a region. Um, we then have some surveillance data, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's sort of little um, dots uh, where the surveillance data was obtained. So that's presences and absences across the area. And when we add that, then we get a posterior um, distribution for infestation. So we start with our prior, we add our surveillance data and we get a posterior. So what do we learn from this posterior map? We learn about the area of freedom, we also learn about the estimated extent and we get these risk maps so that we can target surveillance in the area. We also learn about the individual um, invasion parameter estimates. So we get a posterior distribution for these. So the, the dotted red line is our prior and the solid line then is the posterior distribution for these parameters. So this is our colonisation time, our growth rate and our spread in metres per day. Okay, so we learn about that from these models. We also learn about host suitability. So for each type of plant, how likely is it that the pest lives on that plant, and also our inspectors. So we're coming again to the restaurant process where we have our restaurants and we also learn about the, our inspectors. So for example, some of our inspectors are quite good at inspect, uh, prob this is the probability of detection of the, of the pest. So some inspectors are quite good, like this one here, um, and this one, hang on, let me show you, where am I? This one here. And some inspectors might as well go home and watch television, okay, because they're just not doing very well at all. So some of them need to be re educated. Um, so this was, um, and there might have been other reasons, like they didn't do many, okay? So, um, and this is one of my friends. Okay, so this was an example. So I want to change tack a bit and we'll come back to some other models, but I want to talk about priors. So we can, we've seen examples of conjugate priors. We also have uninformative priors, that's what was, they cared about originally. Um, so how do we get an uninformative or objective priors? We have conferences on that now, obeys, okay, objective priors. We also have weekly informative priors, which we want to have some structure in the prior, but we don't want it to have very much influence in our, in our model, um, in our analysis. And then very informative priors, where we actually care about the prior. Okay, we have some information that we want to put into the model. 
So here's a list of some of the conjugate priors. We've seen a, a, if we have a binomial family um, distribution, likelihood, then we have a beta prior, we'll get a beta posterior. If we have a Poisson um, with an unknown rate parameter and we have a gamma prior on that rate, then we'll have a gamma posterior distribution for that rate. Okay, and a normal we've seen with a normal prior and so on. So different priors will give us that. So the, the nice thing about a conjugate prior is that we, we may want to add data but still have the same form for our, our uh, posterior distribution. It's a nice conceptual thing. We might also, it's very mathematically convenient because we know the form of the posterior. So we know that we can um, have a, a, you know, a distribution that we can aim for in, in um, calculating our posterior. Um, so there's good mathematical and conceptual reasons to have a conjugate prior. But we don't have to stick to that because we can use our computational tools to use any prior that we think is reasonable for our problem. So let's think about what Bayes said. So this was, um, a, many of you may have seen this, but for those of you that haven't, this is what Bayes said about priors. So kick-started the, um, the argument by saying, it's plain that in the case of an event, as I call their M, or their call M, from the number of times it happens and fails in a certain number of trials without knowing anything more concerning it, one may give a guess whereabouts its probability is. And by the usual methods computing the magnitudes of the areas there mentioned, see the chance that the guess is right. And the same rule is the proper one to be used in the case of an event concerning the probability of which we absolutely know nothing antecedently to any trials made concerning it. it. Seems to appear from the following consideration. Concerning such an event, I have no reason to think that in a certain number of trials, it should ha rather happen any one possible number of times than another. So that's a lot of words <laughs> to say. To say, Price said, well, uh, who, who published Bayes' work, Okay, so Price says, the rule must be to suppose the chance is the same, that it should lie between any two equidifferent degrees. So if we translate that again, we might say that it's uniform. Okay, so Bayes' prior for no knowledge is a uniform prior. Okay, so there's... Um, um, that's the argument there. So plausible objective priors are Bayes-Laplace prior, which is a uniform. Jeffrey's prior, which I talked about before, is the sort of the reference prior. So if I have this prior, then I'm going to return effectively my likelihood. So Jeffrey's prior is to say it's proportional to the square root of the determinant of the information matrix. Okay, so that's then in the case of a binomial distribution, that would be a beta half half. So that's that U shape that we saw. Okay, that would be a beta half half. And Zellner, who also um, did a lot of work on priors, had a different representation for a potential objective prior. So you can see that there's some considerations about what actually constitutes an objective prior. Okay. Does anybody here want to comment on objective priors? Yes. When you say uninformative, you mean in some theoretical sense concerning the, pri the parameter you're talking about. I often have many priors in my model, or many parameters in my model, and it's very hard to design a prior which is uniform on the inference of every other prior in the model. That's right. So given that you have a more complex model, I'm not sure I can make sense of it and informative because it doesn't apply across the problem. Exactly. So, um, so the case of Jeffrey's prior was, so one of the things here just to, I'll answer something, I'll say something first and then come back to your thing. So one of the problems with, with the Bayes Laplace prior is that it's not, um, um, if you change the parameterization, 
then you're going to change the, the, the prior, okay? Whereas in um, Jeffrey's reference prior, that won't happen, okay? So it's sensitive to um, reparameterization. Um, coming back to your question, then that's exactly right. So in these more complex models, then coming up with these more objective priors is really almost, well, difficult, I was going to say, but almost impossible. So you may well come up with something that is what I'll call vaguely informative. So, so again, that's where you might use your prior predictive distribution to say, you know, how much information am I actually um, imposing on my, uh, from this set of um, prior distributions? But it, it, it's a good question. Pierre, did you want to add anything? No? No? Okay. All right. So what is the, so if we look at the Jeffreys prior then for our objective prior um, in this case, so we have a, a, in our normal distribution, how would we say that? So what we're going to do then is take our, our likelihood here, it's going to be um, just our normal likelihood. Um, I'm sorry, that should have a, um, a, that should be one on the square root of that, uh, root two pi sigma squared there. Um, we take a P of mu, sorry, I think, take the middle line. <laughs> so we've got P of mu is going to be inversely proportional to the, uh, the square root of the, um, uh, the information um, or the, the, uh, uh, the information matrix here. So we have I of mu, and so then that's going to be given by the expectation of d to mu of the log of f of y of mu squared, and then we do the calculation on that and we get down to 1. Okay? So this is improper prior, and it's also invariant. So it's invariant to transformations. So that's how we get to calculate what this Jeffreys prior might look like, just to give you an example of this. But you're right, in more complex cases, then this is more difficult to do. Um, so if we have now a case where we know mu and we don't know sigma squared, what would the Jeffreys prior look like? Well, the Jeffreys prior would be uh, for, for, sigma, for sigma, P of sigma would be proportional to 1 on sigma. And we can do the calculations again to show that. Um, I'll leave this for you to think about, but what would be a, um, a Jeffreys prior for a Bernoulli case? So that's some homework, just what would that be? Okay. All right. So other priors that we might have are a weakly informative prior, which I was talking about. So basically something like I might have mu with a large variance. And that large variance has to be relative to the problem. So if I'm talking about something in um, millimetres, then it has to be a large variance with respect to millimetres, okay? It has to be with respect to the data. If I'm talking in, you know, um, hundreds of kilometres, then it has to be something in that scale, so in the right sort of scale. Or I can have something subjective, where I have some information that I'm imposing from a previous study or a previous, um, or expert information or something. So I would fill in what M and V are based on that external source of information. Um, so here's an example uh, where we might have, if we have an unknown variance and there's some debate about this or some discussion about this in the literature about what would be appropriate priors to put on variance or precision parameters, where precision is one on the variance. So our conjugate prior would be to put a gamma distribution on the precision. Okay? But um, there's been some debate about that because if I want that to be um, uninformative, then I have small values of alpha and beta, and uh, that can be difficult both computationally and um, to, to conceptualise. So one other option is a uniform distribution on the standard deviation um, between a range that I think is um, reasonable. And so you can set up a, a range from A to B and put a uniform distribution on that. Um, in that way, then you can say, what would I expect the value of sigma to be between A and B? 
and so have some sort of sense of what um, uh, that prior is doing. What are some other priors that people might use for variances or standard deviations or precisions? I'll come back to you in a sec. Anybody? Half normal. Half normal, yep. What else? Half koshi. Half koshi, yes. So what's, what's an advantage of a half koshi? Why would you use that? That the tail spreads really far away from the, from the knee. Right, good. So you're going to have a prior with a half koshi, then it has sort of a, a strong tail, so you would get the, the um, variance um, spreading out. Okay, what else? Log normal. A lo what is that? Log normal. A log normal? Yep. Yep. We like the exponential. Exponential, yep. So, um, so, there's, so tell, me, tell me the arguments for an exponential. So there are several ways of arguing, but one is the forgetfulness property. So if you know that the sigma of this, <coughs> this random effect absorbs, say, two standard deviations, then you still have the exponential above the two standard deviations. But if you have something with a heavier or lighter tail, and depending on the true value of sigma, the amount of count here is different in different pieces of the tail. Good. Okay, thank you. So we can see that there are different ways of setting up priors for precisions, for example. Okay, and it's um, still discussion about that. All right, good. So we come then to a case where, that we're familiar with. So um, a linear regression. So we have now a linear regression case, and how would we set up a, um, a Bayesian model for a linear regression? Well, we have y is x transpose beta plus some, um, some residual epsilon i, and we're going to have our residual epsilon i having a normal north sigma squared um, distribution. We can also set that up as a, as a structure, as you see, exact, exactly equivalent, sorry, an equivalent structure in the second half of the slide there, so the same formulation, but just written differently. Okay, now the reason that I write it like this is because um, uh, the, second, the second formulation, um, you know, it's exactly the same formulation, but, um, but sometimes don't quite see it when you first think of a regression. So what we can do then is think about a conjugate prior, and if we have a conjugate prior, we can put a, the unknowns in the model are going to be beta and sigma squared. So we need a prior for beta and a prior for sigma squared, or a prior for both, okay? So a prior for beta can be a normal distribution, all right? And we can also have a prior for sigma squared is going to be this conjugate prior, which is an inverse Gaussian. Remember we had a, sorry, inverse gamma. So we had a gamma on the precision and an inverse gamma on the variance. Okay, so this is then a way of writing the, um, the uh, conjugate priors for our regression. So when we do that then, we get a posterior distribution, which again is going to be this combination of our data and our prior. So our posterior distribution for beta, if you look at the, the first red line there, is going to be a normal distribution Remember that we started with a prior distribution for beta, which is a normal with a mean of beta naught, okay? And a variance given by um, the, the term there. So keep that in mind. When we go to our posterior distribution, we get another normal distribution. So we have our conjugacy, but now we have a mean of mu one. So if we look at mu one, what we see is that it's going to be this combination of our data coming from x transpose x plus our prior bit, and then we're going to have, um, yeah, it's just a combination of our data and our prior, x transpose x, x transpose y coming from our data, and then the prior coming from um, the, the mu naught and the, um, uh, the other terms. And similarly with sigma squared. We get a posterior distribution that's a combination of our prior and our data. Okay? 
So obviously in this um, two hours, you're not going to memorize that, but I'm sure many of you have seen it anyway. But again, it's just to remind you of the form of it. One of the, um, the useful priors in a regression um, is Zellner's G prior, and I'll, I'll just mention this. Uh, many of you will have seen this as well. But what we can do in this case is, as this, we've been talking about, we can calibrate the prior in terms of our data. So in this case, instead of just setting a variance um, independently uh, for our prior, we can set the variance in terms of our data variance. And this G is going to be the constant that we say is, um, is going to say how many observations worth of data is in my, in my prior. Okay, so how strong do I want my prior to be relative to my data? And the G here is what will do this. So the, the, um, in the prior then we have this G and that's going to be the weight that's assigned to the prior. And you can see how it's related then to um, the, the data. Okay? So this is a useful way of setting up a, a prior in a, in a regression setup. Does anybody have any comments on that? We may see that and we'll see other formulations coming up later. Yes? Um, I guess naively, it seems like there would be some issue with using the data twice. Is that a well, it's not so. The, the thing that you're doing here is not you're not so much using the data twice because you're going to fit. If you look at the posterior distribution, it's all coming about by what you set that G to be. So instead of setting a prior variance as a as a whole value independently, you're actually just setting the G, which is how much do you want it to your variance for the prior to, um, to change compared to your data variance. Okay, so it could be two lots or 10 lots or a half or something, and that's what you're controlling there. Okay, so you're not sort of using the data twice. And you can see that in the last line about how, uh, or in the multivariate normal case, then the, the, um, the G sort of comes in by G on G plus one for the beta hat and the beta naught there. Okay. Okay. Good question. All right. So in high dimensions, then, what do we use for priors? And we've had some discussion earlier about um, people doing high dimensional um, uh, computation or computation for high dimensional regression problems. So we can have just as just putting these here: um, spike and slab priors, lasso regression, or Laplace priors, or elastic net priors as well. So in this case, what the spike and slab prior would be, we're going to say we're in high dimensional regression. We have many variables and we want to reduce the number of variables and just keep the variables that are important. Okay? So what we'll do is set up a prior where we have some probability mass on zero. So this is a prior for beta. Okay? So each beta, the coefficients in my regression, I'm going to put a prior that says there's some probability of that beta being zero and then some distribution if it's not zero. And you can see then that there's going to be this push towards zero. For, for small parameters, they'll get pushed towards zero in that, that probability mass. Okay? So we have different ways of setting up um, um, priors for our high dimensional regression. That's the lasso prior. Right, so now we have our models and now we want to compare models. How do we compare models? So just quickly we can have um, um, base factors um, or posterior odds and what we're going to do there is compare the probability of model 2 given the data over model 1 given the data. So we can compare models directly like that. Okay. So what we're going to do then is take, if we want to do the probability of model 2 given the data, we use the same formulation as we've done before. We're going to say the probability of the data given model 2 times the probability of model 2 okay, over, a, over a constant. When we divide it by then the probability of um, y given model 1 and probability of model 1, those constants cancel out. So what we're left with then is the ratio of the marginal likelihoods 
P of Y given model two versus P of Y given model one, and the ratio of the priors for model two versus model one. So an argument can be, in this case, if I, if I have some other information about which model I prefer, then I can put it in the prior for model two versus model one. If I have no other information and I just think of all models being equivalent, a priori, then I'm left with the marginal likelihood. P of Y given model two over P of Y given model one. Okay? And that marginal likelihood then is my base factor. And so that's what I, can, I'm, I use to compare. I'm just integrating over the parameters there. That's what I can use to, um, to compare models. Okay, that's tip what is often used to compare models. There's a lot of um, discussion about the use of base factors. As you can imagine, they're, you're integrating over the parameters, their um, probabilities, and so they're very, very sensitive. Um, and you're looking at the ratio of those. So again, you've, it's very sensitive and it's an interpretation issue again. So there's lots of discussion that we can have over the week about the use of Bayes factors and I'm sure other speakers will talk about those. Because of these issues of both calculating the Bayes factor and the sensitivity of the Bayes factor, we can look at approximations. So for example, the BIC, Bayesian Information Criterion, or the DIC. Deviance Information Criterion, and the WAIC, okay, the um, uh, Waikiki, oh, who's it? Who's the W in WAIC? Uh, thank you, thank you. So, um, so we have the WAIC. If we don't want to use those approximations or um, base factors, we can look at the posterior predictive fit. We know about the posterior predictive distribution, so we can see where do our observations lie in the posterior predictive distribution. And many people will prefer that as opposed to working out a base factor or a BIC or DIC. To look at the posterior predictive fit and to see where do my observations lie in my posterior predictive distribution. Okay, that's a good, a good um, indicator of model fit. And I can also say, let's avoid this comparison between the different models. Let's actually incorporate the model as one of the unknowns in my analysis. So now I'm going to have um, my parameters and my model as unknowns. And so when I set up the, the, the um, MCMC scheme, for example, I'm going to propose a model and then the parameters, and then I can accept or reject the model. And as I go along then in the, um, in the MCMC scheme, I'm going to have a certain proportion of times that I prefer model two versus model one. Okay, and that will give me an, um, a probability of model two versus model one, and I can use that. So I'm using that in terms of um, reversible jump MCMC, and what I have to do is work out how I jump from one model to another. So if I think of a mixture model, for example, so a mixture model with K components or a mixture model with K plus one components, how would I get from K components to K plus one components? Tell me, what would be a way? So I'm thinking of designing a, um, an algorithm and I have to be able to jump from one model to another, if I'm going to have all of these models in my one analysis. So how do I get from K components to K plus one components? What would I do? I could take a component and split it, and I'd have K plus one components, or I could invent a new component, okay? So I could have a, a split or a birth and I would get from K to K plus one components, okay? Now I wanna go from K plus one to K components, what would I do? Yep. Merge or remove. Yep, merge or remove. So you can see that I would have um, a, a merge or a death to go from K plus one to K, 
and then I could go from model with k components to a model with k plus 1 by having a split and a birth. And that would be reversible. It's the same kind of procedure to go to expand to k plus 1 dimensions or to reduce to k dimensions. So you could see that I could actually conceptually set up a, an, um, a, a, an algorithm to try different k's to go, like to keep adding components or reducing components and then let the data tell me how many components I should have in my mixture model. Does that make sense? That would be a reversible jump. Beautifully, beautiful in conceptual, um, awful in implementation. Well, difficult in implementation. Does this only work on the nested models? Yes. I, I, it can, it's mostly anywhere that you can build a, um, a reversible um, setup. So it doesn't have to be nested, but it has to be reversible. Okay. Um, similarly for birth and death, MCMC. And of course, we don't need to, the nice thing about this is we don't need to choose just one model. Um, we can model average. So if we have, instead of just choosing our best model, we can have a number of candidate models and we can predict from each of those models and then weight the outcomes. Okay, according to model fit or some other criterion. So if we, if we think about doing that, then what we end up with is, so each model will have a different um, representation of the data and a goodness of fit, and then we can, um, we can take an average of those models rather than just choosing one model. Model averaging is used a lot in different contexts. Okay. I just want to show you, we'll just finish with a, a couple of examples. Um, this is uh, priors in practice. So this is um, cat scanning sheep um, here. So we had a project where we uh, were looking to um, understand the proportion of muscle, fat and bone in sheep. Um, so here's a sheep going into a cat scan. Um, apparently they don't mind being wrapped up, <laughs> duct taped and sent through a CAT scan. Basically, this is the kind of image that we get out here. We can see the bone as white, and we want to understand from the grayscale dense, uh, colouring here, or the density, uh, what, um, what's muscle, fat, and bone. So we can fit a mixture model to this, um, where we, have, we might have normal components here, and each component, which might represent different, um, the different components might, might represent muscle, fat, and bone, with um, a different weighting representing the proportion of those different components. So when we do that, we have a mixture model, which um, is going to be this weighted um, combination of our different distributions. We have priors on those different parameters, so the weights, W, and our um, unknowns, mu and sigma squared. <coughs> this is a figure from Christian Robert's book about different kinds of mixture models. Um, as we increase the number of components, what the different kinds of shapes could be for mixture models. So from two components to five components to 25 components to 50 components. Um, when we do that, then we take our image here and it's a grayscale image. So each of these pixels has a value of from one to 256. Okay, so we can actually plot those values here. Um, it's a, just a rescaled version of that. This is a histogram of those grayscale values. And then we can fit our mixture model over that. Does that make sense? So what we can do then is work out how many components and what the parameters of those components are. And then we associate those with muscle, fat and bone. We can actually have a, a hierarchical scale to say that a number of components will represent fat, number of components represent bone and muscle and so on. Um, we can use a similar idea or we can improve that model by having a spatial component in there. So if we go back to our image here, each of these pixels is more likely to be like its neighbours, the neighbouring pixels, than pixels further away. So I can actually learn something about the pixel 
by its, the, the color of its neighbors. Okay, so now I'm, that's the way that I can introduce a spatial component or a spatial prior. I've got more information. So I'm going to use the information of the neighbors to set up a prior for the value of that pixel. Okay, and that's how I would use a spatial prior. All right, um, so we can have spatial priors as well. And we might use that um, going from sheep to cancer. So we've set up a cancer atlas for Australia where we use these Bayesian models. Now we have the number of um, cancers. Thankfully, Nicola's not one of them because he only has the 2% chance of cancer. The number of cancers in a region. In Australia, there are 2,000 small areas or just over 2,000 small areas. And each of those areas has a number of cancers. So we can model that as a Poisson, for example. And we have this um, spatial prior to say that areas close together will look more similar in terms of the cancer rates. So we have this smoothing across the, the areas. And that also helps to protect privacy because we, in some of the cancers, just small numbers in each of the areas. So we have this spatial prior and we can build up then a map of cancer. So we've built this online interactive map. We released it about a month ago. It's got 20 cancers. It's built on Bayesian modeling, um, spatial priors, and the probability of being different from the Australian average. So there's uh, those uh, statements, with probabilistic statements that we talked about earlier. And we can find, for example, here, um, questions like, does where you live impact on your, on your chance of getting cancer or on your survival? And what we found was that there is a really big difference between people who live in country areas and people who live in city areas with respect to their survival. And often it's because they don't get to treatment early, as city people would. So what that meant was that the government because of our, we'd like to think it's all because of our Bayesian modeling, but there were other things. But the government took notice of what we've done and they've changed the subsidy for the travel allowance for people in country areas to get to treatment in the city. So we believe that's a good outcome from our Bayesian models. Or, yes? How much of that is descriptive and how much of that is explanatory? Uh, the, the modeling at the moment is, um, is descriptive in terms of the data and the, 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 the spatial priors. All that's in there at the moment is age and sex. Um, but then what we've done also is take those estimates. So each area has an estimate and an, uh, an credible interval. And we can take those as almost like a meta-analysis then and, or a symbolic analysis and then combine those to look at the impact of uh, other explanatory variables. So we could look at, um, in the process of looking at environmental exposures and um, location of different you know, um, potential risk factors and so on. Yeah. All right, and I think I go from one to another. So the last example then is from cancer to um, ICU, so predicting death after heart surgery. Um, uh, so um, we have uh, in one hospital in Brisbane, they're interested in this. This was one of our first projects on looking at Bayesian analysis. So we had um, nothing like cutting your teeth on death after heart surgery, trying to predict that. But uh, the problem is that the hospital doesn't have many deaths. So it's good for the hospital, good for the patients, bad for the modelers. And we asked them, like, can you increase the number of deaths because it's really hard to model just a small number? And they said no. Uh, so we said, OK, what other information do we have? Well, in the US, they have um, a large study of um, um, uh, um, hosp in hospitals. And they have a risk factor model, which is like a logistic regression. OK, so each person then gets a probability of death after heart surgery. So what we did was use the parameters from that risk factor model and put that in as priors for our data in our local model. So we went from the, 
the, so it was like adapting the, the US uh, model to the local model. And we saw some differences that were really important for the local um, predictions, but it was better than just using the small number that we had in our study and better than just using the US study. Okay, I'll close with that. That's some of the examples that we've used um, and just a very brief introduction to Bayesian modelling and I'll hand back over to Nicola. Quite a break. <laughs>